I had mentioned earlier that 2023 is the year of the Celosia. So this is one of our year of programs. This is our annual. And so the entire year, we're trying to inspire and educate everybody about how to grow and use Celosias. So what I wanted to jump into is like an overall explanation. And so we have three basic types of Celosia. Michael, I think you were going to start with the Cristata and explaining what type of celosia that is. Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I uh, just a little bit about celosia Cristata. Um, I was doing a little bit of research about this one. And from what I gather, uh, it's been changed. It was formerly celosia Cristata and now it's uh, celosia Argentia uh, sub variety Cristata. Um, also commonly called the coxcomb celosia. So native to India, uh, it's known for uh, its very, very unique flower structure looking like the top of a rooster's head. Um, comes in all different shapes and sizes uh, from cut varieties down to, to bedding varieties. And uh, um, they that, that's a, a very, I guess, saturated uh, part of Celosia breeding out there. So a lot of really, really good varieties of Celosia cristata. Um, uh, just a really, really cool looking plant overall. It is cool. I always want to just like rub the head of yeah, it. You know, yeah, it just is yeah. a fuzzy. It's, it has a very really... tangible look to it. You want to, you look at it, that one, and you know, where you brush over a plumosa, that's kind of nice. You really want to kind of like just scratch that one to, to see what it's all about. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very, um, um, textural and, yes. and heightens the senses, I guess you yes. should say. Yeah, you so. experience that plant with with definitely more than the scent or uh, the the sense of sight. Right, <laughs> right. Okay. Uh Katie, do you want to talk about spicata? Uh yep. And I, I'd like to point out behind me is kind of an example of one of my favorite of the kind of cristata types where that turns it if it grows on itself, it turns into like a brain, you know, kind of unique quality to it. Um, but spicata is again in that Argenta genus, but subspe subspe subspecies is spicata. It gives the plant a different form. Um, it's This could be used again in multiple ways, but you can see from the photo that it's going to shoot up multiple heads. And these are going to be smaller flowers in general, but multiple flowers. And they have a crispy kind of texture and the spicata or spike is kind of where it gets its name. It's also sometimes known as like the, the wheat flower um, because it has that, it, it, it grows like a, like a head of a sheath of wheat might grow. Um, but it's much more colorful because it does come in several vibrant colors there. Um, and this one again can range in multiple heights. Um, and so you can find uses for this in many areas of your garden. Um, I know one of our intense celosias with the spicata has uh, a fall uh, color opportunity. So this would be a plant that you could actually grow and, and enjoy alongside your favorite chrysanthemums um, or other fall loving pansies. Um, and it has those colors of the season that could really play off of those two. Excellent. Um, and now Ken, the plumosa. Yes, as uh, Katie just mentioned there with the spicata type, pretty easy to kind of remember these. The cristata is like a crest, the spicata is a spike, and then the plumosa is the big plumes that you generally see on celosia for sale at retail or in, you know, at garden centers, big boxes, wherever. Those are the most common ones out there um, with those big plumes, very colorful, usually in various colors of red, uh, yellow, and orange and rose, but those are the ones that you're going to see most out in the uh, in the landscape. They tend to last a little bit longer, although the uh, cristata types do last a long time. And I like that description. They do look like brains. They really do. First time I saw them, that's just a brain plant. So yeah, um, plumosa plume type, very colorful. Speaking of colors, um, as as these celosia were found in nature and as they've um, been bred over the years, are there some basic colors that they come in? And then what are some of the more unusual colors? Ken, you're on screen. I'll let you just jump right into that one. Okay. Um, yeah, generally they're going to come in um, in red, the, the plumosa type, 
in red, yellow, and orange, and rose. Uh, the Cristadas you generally see in reds and yellows because those are the most popular types. And the, uh, the Spicata, the spike types, that's going to be kind of more like a lavender, purple, rose, pinky color. Um, but um, for the most part, um, they, they come in various shades of, of um, all of those colors across the spectrum, except for blue. You really don't see a blue one. In fact, there's not a lot of blue it's flowers in you know the retail landscape. So whenever one does come across that looks ex exceptional, everybody seems to jump on it right away. Yeah, blue blue is that that reach for it color. Um, but in in its natural you know um, genus of of colors, there's such a range. In even in those yellows, you could get everything from um, a very vibrant neon to almost a green, like a tone on tone in the green, I think is, is really uh, like that mono color is, is, is beautiful as well. But yeah, that horticultural, you know, kind of blue that we all know and love um, is, is probably not going to be found in your Celosia. You'll, you'll choose other plants to pair it with for, if you want that blue. Good point. So we already have a question on something that I didn't have on my list of questions, and it's about Celosia being edible. And I was, when we first were launching the year of the Celosia, like late last year, there were some articles going around about Celosia being edible. And I think somebody said that one of these Celosia is native to India. And so I believe that in Indian cuisine, um, Celosia is a delicacy. Is there anybody that uh, on our panel that has tried eating celosia? So I've never tried eating the leaves, but I think in the spicata family, it, it has that quality, the leaf, uh, um, the amount of leaves or the types of leaves that it produces has an almost spinach-like quality. Um, so very similar to like uh, when you eat a pansy that has an arugula, peppery kind of flavor. This, this is almost in that leafy spinach category. And uh, some of our uh, teammates that uh, manage our um, categories in Southeast Asia, this when they when they're breeding this, I would assume that they're having um, a feast as well uh, while they're breeding. Yeah, I, I think most commonly it's uh, the the leaves are are eaten, and uh, uh, I also know that a close cousin in in the amaranth family is quinoa. So uh, you know the uh, fertilized flowers then become the fruit. And then that makes the, the, the quinoa grain. So, um, but specific to these celosias, yeah, it's it's mostly the leaves that get eaten. Excellent. Uh, for the oh. wide audience though, when we as breeding companies talk about um, how we're making selections, we're making selections for that flower. And so we're not really making selections for culinary taste. So there actually might be better suited culinary types of celosias out there, whereas the majority of what we're talking about are ornamental bread for that flower, not so much for the leaf because we want the color. And then also one does want to be really certain of how these plants are grown if you have the intention to eat them. Uh, Taki runs into this all the time because we do breed ornamental kale. And I get the question all the time, can I eat it? And I'm like, yeah, you can, but there's actually breeding done on culinary kale, which is going to be so much more tastier and also grown appropriately for for eating, not uh, not just for looking. So <clears throat> while you can eat uh, celosias, you really want to make sure that one, you're getting the best taste out of the selection that you choose for eating and then also making sure you know how it's grown. Good point. We always get that question about ornamental peppers. Yes. Okay, so they're a pepper. Can I eat them? And I'm like, uh, you can, but, but, heat, but there's no flavor. So, yeah. or they are super, super hot. You They're know, there's hot. some of those too. So it's like, you know, buy the peppers that are bred to be eaten and just use the ornamental peppers for ornamental purposes. I mean, I know you maybe want to get two purposes out of it and it's nice. And there are some new things coming out that can be both, but that's like another whole webinar topic. Um, okay. So one more thing before we go into this, um, I had said Celosia is the the plant for our year of the annual program. And so I just wanted to ask this, would there be any regions where it could be considered perennial or are there any perennial types? 
I think a majority of the celosia that you'll find in your favorite garden store or the ones you'll start from seed yourself are, are going to be meant for that season of gardening and not necessarily um, overwintering in the, in the ground. Um, but that doesn't mean that the potted plants couldn't be enjoyed at different types of seasons. Um, and, you know, things can always, you can always try to bring things indoors, um, but they'd have to be protected. That if, if, if exposed to certain levels of frost, and extreme temperatures, then this plant is not gonna survive through that like a true perennial will. I believe the zones we're thinking of are like way down in zone nine, tens, elevens, those tropical climates where you really don't get a frost opportunity. Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna wanna treat these as annuals and then um, start, start them over again each year. But because um, a lot of these still do produce seed, you may find that if you leave the plants um, to go to seed in your garden, that you may get volunteers coming from those seed heads. Oh, that that's a good point. Because that was, I think, one of my questions. You know, do you, will they reseed and come back next year? And so, Jessica, you answered that. And yes, I have several and, types um, that I just um, I knew to plant them in an area where it was a bit more cottage garden instead of formal. And so, I actually enjoy continuous year after year uh, plants because they're reseeding themselves, not because they're perennial, but because they're reseeding themselves and then growing fresh the next year. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so now we're gonna get started. We're just gonna go through many different um, series. And so each one of us will just kind of jump in and talk about them quickly. Um, but before we do that, who, um, who wants to talk about the difference between a series and a mix and how the breeders present them? Happy to take that one. So yeah, Taki does have several series of celosias. And so what a series means is that we'll have different colors that all match the same characteristics. So if we had a Cristata that was dwarf, that was meant for landscape use, the series will have a name, um, usually a, a marketing, you know, a good marketing name, and then we'll have different colors in that series, meaning they will, they should all follow uh, those characteristics. So that's a series. And then what about a mix? Who wants to talk about a mix? Um, a mix of those, um, especially from seed, means that you'll have uh, a, maybe a pack or a, a container that will will provide you multiple colors, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the plant itself will produce multiple colors on one plant, but the seed has been provided to you as a nice kind of shaped up mix so that when you place it in your uh, cell packs or when you're growing them in the gardens, then you can have a multicolor mix. The other thing is maybe a collection. Um, you might have a marketing name for a collection and that could mean that could be a variance in height or uh, or size or flowering time, but they behave in a general way that you'd like to group them together. So hey, that's the that, difference between kind of a mixture and collection yeah. and then a series. That is an excellent drilling down into a difference of series and collection. Series generally, a series mix is generally going to be uh, the colors within that same characteristics, like all cristatas or all plumosas, whereas, yeah, a collection might be a mix of even different flower types. Excellent. Okay, so we've got those definitions. So as we go through here, let's let's start uh, going through some of these series. Um, one of the first ones that we have is the ACT series. And as you can see, this is a Cristata. Comes in a number of different colors. Comes in Dara, which is a velvet pink. Diva is copper red. Inca is yellow. Rima is rose. Verda is green, which I think Katie had mentioned some of the green colorations. Uh, Vita is lemon colored, Zara is orange, Ziva is pink, Barbora is purple, and Barbosa is a champagne colored. So the ACT series, very good for cut flowers and comes in a large number of colors. The next one is the Arabona series, which is a little bit newer on the market. As you can see, it comes in a bronze leaf with a red plume on it, and it comes green leaf also with a red plume and orange and yellow. So that's the Arabona series. Next up is the Armor series. Jessica? 
Yeah, so this one is a, a landscape type, so it's going to stay 12 to 15 inches max, and you can see it is brain-like, um, and we've got, yeah, orange, purple, red, yellow, and a mix in the series, all with green foliage, and um, basically what we love to say is how this thrives in heat and, uh, and performs very well in the landscape. Excellent. Okay, next one is, this is not a series, this is a one-off. It's called Asian Garden. As you can tell, this is that uh, spicata wheat type, um, and it was trialed in the AAS trials and won for performance and durability and the number of flowers, flower spikes on each plant, and that coloration, which um, held its color through the, the summer heat. And then we've got the Bombay series. I think that might be you, Katie. Yep, on, on mute, of course. Um, yeah, the Bombay series is um, awesome in the sense that it's got that Cristata beginnings. It's not necessarily meant to get as wide and brain-like as the others. So you're gonna have a very tall stem. So if you're looking for something for a uh, home cut garden, um, you want to build your own bouquets, then this would be a good choice for you. It's going to flower in June, July, August in, in these types of, of colors. Um, and then, you know, as tall as 40 inches, so really good stem. Um, and it's going to have, uh, it's more of like a branching, it's, it's a single stem with very few leaves for that purpose. Excellent. Thank you. Now, this is funny, the Brainiac series, number of you have mentioned that it looks like a brain. So we do have a compact landscape type of um, the, the, um, the Cristata type, and it comes in multiple colors. And there again, you can see that that dark, dark pink, almost purplish one has the darker colored foliage, whereas the others have the green foliage. And so that is the Brainiac series. And Jessica. Yes, so Castle, this is uh, a Themidorf Celosia with vigorous uh, habit, but self-branching. So that provides long last flowering as um, you know, you get the new, of new flower branches. Um, I think one thing we've got to just really pay attention to is how Celosias tolerate heat and humidity. And in Georgia, uh, we love Celosias. And Castle is a pink is an AAS winner. These plants are about 16 to 20 inches in height. And then, yeah, you've got the orange, the pink, which is the AAS winner, scarlet, yellow, and a mix. Thank you. Okay, Katie, the Selway series. Yeah, here's another cut flower garden option for you, uh, but it's in that spicata type. So we, we looked at the, uh, the Cristata, and now we have a very tall singular spike, a plume with a, with a spiky plume in the center, and then smaller several spikes along the bottom that helps your bouquet feel a little bit more full. It's just giving a little bit more color down that, that stem. And the one thing about the Selway series is it's really good if you need to pack a lot into a small space. It's not going to affect the the flowers. Not going to out um, outpace each other. They're gonna they they don't mind it if you crowd them up. And the stems for this one are quite strong, which is good because once you get that big flower spike, you don't want something kind of floppy that you'll have to really ultra support in your garden. So the strong stems with the smaller leaves will give you a nice base life and a good texture in the garden too. Excellent. Okay, our cicada friends want to talk about the Century Series, and I know at least one or two colors is an AAS winner. Michael, go ahead. Okay, so uh, the Century Series, we have uh, three main plumosa types for, for landscape and pots. Um, you'll see the other two coming up here. Uh, we kind of sorted them as a small, medium, and a large. Uh, this would fall into the large category. Uh, it's been around for a little while. Ken, I don't know which colors exactly uh, were AAS winners, but like Diane said, I know that there are a couple of them um, that have won through the years. So uh, just very uniform uh, in habit and flower timing, uh, as well as a comprehensive color range um, to the colors that we were all talking about at the beginning of, uh, I guess that Ken, I think that Ken was, was talking about at the beginning uh, where we have a yellow, a red, an orange, and a rose, uh, and we may have uh, one or two beyond that. Um, but just a, a very nice series that's been around for a long time and uh, has, is tried and true. 
and Gail just posted a link. Um, it's actually the mix that was um, an mm -hmm. AES winner, was, is. I, and, I, I shouldn't make it past tense. It's present. Once a winner, it's always uh, a winner. Diane, to that point, uh, and, and echoing what Katie and Jessica were saying at the beginning of all of this, uh, if you have a mix uh, that does well, that only speaks to the uniformity of the series because the mix usually has seeds from every single color inside of that series. So if a mix is the winner, uh, you know, that means that you have very, you know, colors that play very, very, very well with each other inside that series. Good point. And so, yeah, that's, you know, if you're planting this in your front yard in a big landscape bed, or maybe there's landscapers doing, you know, commercial installations, you want them uniform. So you don't want all the, the different heights, unless that's your intent. Now, like Jessica said, she had maybe a little bit less formal cottage garden, and she wanted the different heights. So sure. the wonderful news is there's something for everybody. Um, okay, Michael, you're going to stay on, or are we going to go to Ken to talk about the Chief series? Okay, Ken, you want this one? Um, Bob's going to take this one. Okay. okay. If he's still on. We get to hear from Bob. <laughs> okay, yeah, the um, Chief series is a good, is a uh, Coronata type. It's um, looks kind of like the brain, and it basically is a wonderful cut flower, tall cut flower. Uh, most cut flower growers will will direct seed it in the ground because the seed is not is not as expensive. So they'll seed it directly in the ground and thin to maybe allow four inches, five inches between plants, and then it grows up to be a beautiful uh, cut flower that can be either dried or used in fresh uh, arrangements. And there's a wide variety of colors, really nice bright jewel tone colors. So it adds that not only texture but also color and height to uh, arrangements. I've also seen it used in containers um, outside of a restaurant and a hotel, people that want something different in a container for a uh, thriller type uh, product. So it has a lot of versatility. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, let's see. Next, Katie, you're going to talk about concertina. Yeah, and I'd like to draw your attention to the one in the center there. So that vibrant kind of neon pink with a very dark leaf. Um, concertina is our potted celosia. So when we breed this plant, we're looking for that indoor living color option. So if you're a plant parent and you love your greenhouse plants and you're looking to mix things up with adding a little bit of flowers or something to, to care for uh, in, a, in a small amount of time during the summertime, you have a sunny window, then look for a potted celosia from concertina. We've got, you know, the mix by itself, but then also green and bronzy dark leaves as well. So the, and I've been told that the bronzier leaf actually helps you indoors too, because obviously if you're going with a green leaf, you definitely need to give it a lot of sun because it's going to require that light to produce the green and the chlorophyll so that your plant looks as healthy as it can. But when you have a bronzier or a darker leaf, it may not require that amount of sunlight to keep it looking fresh and looking beautiful. So that could be an option if you're, if you have maybe only a few hours of sunlight, um, you can look for some of the bronzier leaf indoor flowering plants like concertina. Um, and it's, it's shorter. It's only going to get about 10 inches high. It's, you can see it here on the windowsill or in a, you know, three of them stuck together in a pot. They're not going to overgrow their area. They're going to just be this gorgeous little decor plant for your, your indoor or tabletop outdoor living. Okay, and don't go anywhere, Katie. Tell us about this one, Dracula. That's, yeah, that's my favorite. That's the one in my background. I mean, with this name, it is, a, it's our standalone Celosia on behalf of Pan American Seed. It's just so moody. I mean, it's got the Cristata type. It will expand into a very textural dark blood, I'm going to say it, blood red, blood red brain um, with these leaf shape that overhangs like a vampire cape. I'm just going to say it. It just looks like it could be quite moody in your garden and really set a tone for something. If you're looking for uh, a different kind of vibe in your outdoor space, it does really well in containers. It can also do very well in the landscape as a front border. It's not going to get super tall. It's only maxing out at maybe 16 inches if you're in the, the really warm climates. Um, but it really is one of its kind um, with that overlapping leaf shape, um, giving it a real personality for your garden. So definitely check out Dracula. 
Okay, I feel like we um, might be talking about goth gardening, which is a webinar we have coming up. This, so if anybody this would be a superstar in a goth garden, I'm exactly. just exactly we'll little make googly sense. eyes on the on the flower and you know little fangs, it's ready. <laughs> okay, that's good. And now we're gonna. Um, I feel like we're in a world of fantasy gardening also. So we've got goth, we've got fantasy. Um, Sakata has something called Dragon's Breath. So here we go. Who wants to talk about Dragon's Breath? Diane, I guess I'll talk about Dragon's Breath. Um, Dragon's Breath came out several years ago. And one thing I want to point out, out about almost all Celosia uh, to gardeners, because it really doesn't pertain too much to them as it does a grower, but this one might. Um, all Celosia are essentially short day plants, but they'll get up to a certain height where they'll automatically revert to the to flowering and they'll go ahead and flower and produce seed. Dragon's breath is a little bit different. It is an obligate short day plant, which means it needs short days to flower. So if you're gonna plant this in, the, in your garden, you'll usually buy it already in bloom. And that's because the supplier has provided short days at their greenhouse to put it or to get it to bloom. However, um, if you're gonna, plant this from seed or you buy it and it's not in bloom during the summer, it's not going to flower until we start approaching fall. In the meantime, you have this brilliant, brilliant maroon, deep maroon foliage plant that can get up as tall as, you know, 24 to 28 inches, depending on where you are in the country. This is an excellent plant of the landscape and provides that deep maroon color. Um, but um, it is something that, you know, gardeners should be aware of. You buy it in bloom. It will continue to bloom um, throughout the summer. I have seen it revert back to, to veg vegetative if planted in the, uh, in the ground, in a ground bed, but usually in a container, it continues to flower throughout the summer. Okay, excellent. Now don't go anywhere, Ken. We have Fire Chief for you. Yeah, Fire Chief is, is just a specific um, uh, variety from the uh, Chief series. Um, I know this was not an AAS award winner, but it's, it's a, kind of almost like a standalone within the series. It's such a brilliant scarlet red color. It is exceptional in outdoor cut flower you know, gardens, but it's something that's gonna get a little bit taller, depending on where you are again in the country, it could get up to two feet, generally somewhere between 18 and 24 inches, but it has that brilliant, brilliant scarlet red uh, uh, crest at the top of, of the uh, plant uh, is just outstanding in the garden. Yeah, that's a beautiful red. Okay. Um, you notice that there's a lot of flame and fire terminology going on here, dragon's breath, et cetera. Um, so Katie, tell us about the First Flame series. Yeah, First Flame is kind of your workhorse, mid height bedding, landscape, garden bed, uh, celosia. So it's a, it's a little bit taller than maybe the smaller ones you might find in stores. So it, it's gonna meet maybe your mid border, or if you're in the South, a little taller in the back, um, but it's, brightly colored. It's got that traditional flame plumosa feather. Um, it's almost more frilly too. It has it has really kind of like a slightly double along each of its um, petals and spikes so that you get even more of an intense coloring. Um, and it does cross across a lot of colors. So it does have a mix. Uh, so hyper uniform, whatever color you choose, it's going to be around the same height. So it gives you an idea of how to plan your garden. Um, but yeah, very full look, um, really good for southern markets, um, and you know could also work in containers if you if you like you need a little bit more of a mid height filler as well. Okay, and continuing on with the flame motto, the Flama series. Uh, this is from Sakata. We have one color that's an AAS winner. Uh, Ken or Michael, you want to talk about the other colors in the series? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll oh, talk about ahead. it. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I'll let you join in too, Michael. Okay. This is a series that was just introduced uh, within the last couple of years. Um, it is an excellent uh, mid-size celosia. I think the outstanding part of it that I saw throughout the trials across the country is how well the color holds up in the heat 
uh, throughout the summer, especially when you get into the reds. Um, there's uh, five colors available, um, you know, like bright red, the golden, the golden is exceptional, the orange is exceptional, but the bright red, and then we have a red and a rose. I grew all of these in my garden this past summer, and all of them did exceptionally well. One thing I do want to point out, though, with all of the series, something that I have always noticed through the years being in a northern state, when you plant celosia in a ground bed, they get up to what's really the minimum height that you'll see advertised. But if it's in a container where the soil stays warmer, then it will grow a little bit taller. So if something like the Flama series grows from 12 to 14, 16 inches tall, you'll see it approach this, the higher you know, height uh, in, when it's in a container than it will in a ground bed, simply because the, uh, the soil, the native soil stays a little bit cooler than in a container. Um, so Flama is like that. The ones I had were just branching, exceptional branching from the base and just continually flowering all summer long. It's an excellent addition to our series. So Michael, got anything else to add there? Go ahead. No, you covered all the bases with uh, gigantic flowers and strong stems that hold them upright, as well as uh, you, you, you mentioned color longevity. That was the big box to check and the, uh, the branching. Uh, as you can see here with the orange, which is the current AAS winner from the series, uh, this, as far as mid-sized types uh, goes, is 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 one of the one of the really really strong branchers, I guess, in its class. So, uh, really really excited with this one. Excellent. Thank you for the support of All America Selections. You see a lot of AAS winners um, in here. So, Celosia is a big category. Which here's here's another series where the gold, red, and yellow are all AAS winners. And I think this was probably between 15 and 20 years ago, but it's still on the market. So Fresh Look series is one of those long lasting Celosia that's been on the market for a while. And now we have our little baby tasty ones, the ice cream series. Katie, you want to tell us about that? Yep. Ice cream is the like a little sister of our first flame. So she's going to be smaller, shorter in heights um, for the front of the border. Uh, but this is your heat tolerant, long lasting color for your Celosia garden. We like to say this is an ice cream that won't melt in the sun uh, because you'll have this this kind of double scoopy look in, in beautiful colors that hold right above the foliage. Uh, so when you plant these in mass, you really have these little flower heads um, all across your garden. And so there's one main head with like probably little multiples kind of skittering around little friends uh, there as well. They're, they're really early as well. So this could be, you know, something that you could start from seed um, and have in your garden pretty early as well. Um, and they're just, they're just really a versatile type of kind of pack run, plant a bunch of them um, in your garden. Thank you very much. Okay, the next one, we had been talking a lot about seed varieties. This is actually a variety that is uh, comes from vegetative cuttings. So for anybody looking at it, looking for this at the garden center, um, you will be able to get it as plant form, not as seed. This is one of those spicata types, candela pink. Um, one of our ju uh, judges called it the energizer bunny of the trials that year that it just kept blooming and blooming and blooming. And obviously in a combination container, it would be that thriller item that would add some height and some bright color to it. And then next up, we have the Kilo fire series. So again, going along with that fire and flame, this is from a European breeder member that we have. And you can tell that there's eight colors there. I don't need to name them for you. But if you see the fire series, you'll know that those come in a lot of colors. Then we have the kimono series. Uh, Sakata, this is from you. Michael, go ahead. Sure. Okay. So I mentioned uh, we have three buckets in our uh, in our potted and landscape celosia plumosa uh, that we, you know, that we kind of dropped into with the uh, um, with the flama being midsize and the century being our, the largest uh, of our of our three. This one is the smallest uh, of the three. It's a it's a dwarf type. Uh, very again, 
Uh, uniformity is something that we uh, try to carry into all of our series uh, and most specifically in the in the Solosias that we have. Uh, this one is also incredibly, incredibly uniform. So uh, very, very nice for uh, for landscaping uh, as well as pots. If you want to keep, you know, like a, a small tabletop pot, um, this is a great fit for uh, for all of that. Comprehensive color range. Again, I believe the the pot that you see on the right has everything, all the entire series in it, I believe. Um, Looks like it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so just just another another great one that's been around for a long time and uh, another tried and true series that is uh, is not slowing down. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. OK, Katie, you've got the Cosmo. Yep. Jumping onto that kind of small mini gardening, um, you know, lots of impact in a very small space. This is our Cosmo series. And you can see from the picture we have the green leaf as well as the darker red leaf. Um, but these are. These are babies. These are only going to get about eight inches tall. So they're perfect for potted plants, that indoor decor, that indoor flower color, living color um, that you can enjoy for several months. Um, and it's it's not going to, it's got a single flower head with multiple little spikes. So this is a spicata version of a very kind of small celosia. Um, and it's genetically small. So you, there's no reason to actually like pinch and keep it this way. You don't have to, you know, make sure that it stays small. It just genetically wants to stay this tight and, and cute and uh, colorful. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jessica, how about this brainy looking one? Yeah. So this is the Karume series. So it's that Cristata type. Uh, whereas some cut flowers have more of a fan shaped with the, with the brain topping, this one will create more of a, a bulb or a bowl look to it. I do want to point out that Corona is that red gold one that's at the bottom there that has that like multicolor look to it, which is quite striking and neat. Uh, this one, yeah, comes in gold, new scarlet, orange, red, and rose. Uh, you are talking about a cut flower type. So when we say that, it means it's going to get tall. So 28 to 48 inches. And uh, you're going to want to provide netting or support as you would for a lot of your cut flowers anyways. This one's no different. And yeah, this is high tolerance to heat. So um, it's drought and disease uh, resistant, which makes it prime for summertime uh, cut flower use. Excellent. Speaking of cut flowers, we've got the Martine series. This one comes in pink, purple, salmon, scarlet, and yellow. This is a little bit like the one Katie had mentioned, where instead of the full wide coxcomb brain look, it's 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 a narrower version. So I'm just going to call that one frilly, but that one again would be excellent for cut flowers. And then Katie, the Neo series. Yep, uh, our Neo series is um, a, a breed of plant that we'll probably find, find more in bouquets and like florist bouquets or available at a wholesale florist if you're an arranger. Um, probably not going to find this in packs or seeds at your garden center, but just, just know that the breeding that Pan American Seed does, um, everything that we go to find out about our cut flowers, sometimes we have, you know, excitements that happen in the garden as well. So when we breed for um, our professional cut flower market, we're looking for a smaller leaf type. You know, when you have less leaves, it helps them uh, stay in the bouquet or in the vase better. There's less leafy that, you know, anyone who's had a bouquet and had to rip off leaves because it just gets kind of moldy or wet in, in the vase itself. So we've bred this one specifically to be, um, you know, have smaller leaves so that it doesn't uh, mess up the arrangement for the professional grower. Um, it's slightly taller than Bombay and thicker than Bombay, and it has a, a yellow color that is really saturated and and like one of the deepest yellows uh, in the cut flower market is Neo. Okay, and now we're not even going to talk about flowers. We're going to talk about oh. foliage only. Yes, and this is relatively new uh, avenues for us. So we were we're just enamored with the possibilities of the boom without the bloom. You know, the, the flower is secondary on these types of celosia. So they are technically still celosia, but we're calling it a foliage celosia. So it's, it doesn't necessarily even have a flower to really admire. It's a bonus. Sometimes it'll pop up a little cristata, like a little baby cristata or in a bright pink, or it might be a spicata type. Um, but really what we're doing is gecko green and uh, lizard leaf are kind of your summer cabbage. You know, you're talking about that ornamental foliage, ornamental, um, when, you, when, you, when you're designing for fall and you're putting cabbage and kale in your garden amongst your pansies and your mums, and you're like, gosh, I wish I had something that did that in the summertime and took the heat and the high light. 
this is what that does. So no, not an edible cabbage, but it kind of has that look. And one is more green leafy and the other is more bronzy to kind of give uh, different vibes uh, and 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 looks in your garden to match up with different things. But this flower is secondary or just a bonus. Um, it's really all about um, kind of eyeing and design uh, the, a beautiful border or a mixed container. Very cool. And then you've got another cut flower, the Sunday. Why? The Sunday series. Sunday. And, and this one is a cut flower plumosa. So when you're, you know, we talked about how the spicata was the wheat, you know, flower, but this one actually just has a very tall single spike. You can see uh, from some of the, the photos that the, the, the foliage is not necessary. This is just a very tall texture for your professional cut flower or your home cut garden. Um, it really has really good vase life. So, you know, that's why that's why professional cut flower and florists love um, celosia because it's kind of like a carnation. It will have a, a really beautiful um, option for really long base life, really long bouquet life. Um, and it's just gorgeous colors, um, really tall texture and like a multitude of colors. And this one is the one that has that a green in it as well, um, which which we like that tone on tone is kind of pretty. Excellent. And Jessica, I think you get to wrap up with the X version of our Celosia. I don't, uh, I don't get to talk about this one. <laughs> You don't get to. OK, well, we will just um, wrap up by saying this is one from Sahin out of Europe, which is a sister company to American uh, Taki. OK. And again, a very good cut flower, maybe needing I think Jessica mentioned some netting, maybe needing some staking. But um, the coloration there of that creamy white with just a little hint of pink or purple on it um, was really attractive about this one. So that's, I'm just going to leave this one up on the screen for a little bit because there's a couple questions here that I wanted to get to. And I think I'm not trying to, to pick on our cicada folks, but we know that cicada does both vegetative and seed breedings. And the question is, is there a certain type of celosia that would more lend itself to being um, bred and propagated vegetatively versus seed? It looks like um, a lot of the plumosa types would be from seed. So is there a way that you can kind of define that? Or is it uh doesn't matter it's just kind of like open game and they're breeding in all kinds of areas well speaking for cicada all of our celosia are from seed we don't have any um vegetative types however um when you're talking or discussing the the two types generally when breeders are doing their selections they always want to make sure that all the seed types are true to type, that every seed that comes up is going to be exactly like the next one or very, very, very close. Um, but every now and then something pops up that is unique all to itself and it can't be propagated by seed um, and get the same type, you know, season after season after season. So what they'll do is they'll keep uh, a mother stock supply of those, and then they take cuttings off of them so that every one that you get, every cutting that you get is going to be just like the one before it. So that's essentially what, from a breeding standpoint, the difference between seed produced one and a vegetative one is that the breeder has found something so unique that can't be propagated by seed, you know, 100% guaranteed to be the same one so they'll just take cuttings off of it and sell it that way okay great thank you um another basic question that i didn't ask in the beginning um sun or shade i'm i'm hearing they love the heat they do very well in the south so i'm assuming they prefer sun and is there a certain minimum number of hours of sun that they need every day this is definitely going to be your sun lover um, and how you would pair it with other plants for the best success um, that would it it's going to flower in and it's going to flower late spring, mid summer to into the late summer. Um, if you're looking at the fall, those are those are plants that are produced and available in the fall because they've been grown with the highlight and, you know, they'll they'll last through the season until the frost takes them. But generally they love the heat and they love the light um, potted plants. 
could probably get down to four hours of light, or if it's an indoor plant, the the you'll get your best results if you put it near a sunny window or as much sunlight as you can offer it. Um, and then you'll have an indoor enjoyment for you know a month or two, maybe several months if you are able to um, not keep it too cold um, in the in the season as well. Great, thank you. Okay, and here's another question that I might interject with something, but I will let our panelists um, answer also. So the question is, can all celosia be pruned to get more branching or is it best to use a self branching variety? And so I'm going to interject here, um, you know, National Garden Bureau works with a lot of different breeders from around the world. They submit their new varieties. One of the traits we see time and time again on new varieties, this is also applies to the AES entries, is better branching. What does better branching mean? It means more branches. Each branch has more flowers. So I'm going to say that, but I would like our panelists to talk about either deadheading or pinching back. So I know that these questions would just be great if we had a simple answer. Um, and so the the question is about pinching, and I'm I, I what my immediate response is it depends. So are you a cut flower grower and you're trying to get more side shoots, or are you just wanting this for your landscape where you want more uh, plumes to fill in a space? So with those two different scenarios, whether you pinch um, depends. And then to speak to the fact that our our breeding is meant to do the work for you so that you don't have to pinch because they're self-branching um, is also something you consider. But now if I just described one of our landscape types and I said, you know, it was 18 inches of height and you're like, whoa, that's too much height for your container or your or your use, well then yes, uh, please by all means pinch it for the use you need it for so that you can, you know, dwarf it and then even get more branching. But yeah, for the pot, pot and landscaping types, they are bred to be uh, self-branching and well-branched. And then for the cut flowers, um, I do know of cut flower growers who do pinch at a certain um, number of leaf nodes to get side shoots. However, caution with that because a lot of the breeding does the work for you and there are cut flower types of celosias that are meant to just give you that one great stem and you can do nice dense planting um, and you'll get the best quality bloom by just letting it do its natural breeding uh, that was built into it. So and I will say for the average gardener too, um, this is a flower that's not going to cycle out as quickly as like your petunias will. So you're not going to see, it's it's going to be a very long lived flower. And again, some of our breeding is trying to get that flower to mature into a, a lovely um, sepia color, as opposed to something that just turns brown and ugly and you want to get rid of it. So I don't think deadheading in the sense that if you, if you have a plant that you're not thrilled with the color of the bloom or it, it's it's gotten a little damage, you can take that part off and it will encourage more blooming. But it's not necessarily a plant that you would want to deadhead often. Um, you're going to enjoy the 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 all of the classes um in and for a very long time in your garden before you'll even have to get to those stages. So I think our summary is celosias are pretty easy to grow. <laughs> um, and that's a wonderful thing. Somebody has just asked about, um, okay, so Bob is answering. Wow, you've got a great answer there about pinching and everything. Um, are they frost sensitive? I mean, we we're talking about how they're heat lovers. So come fall, will they kind of stand up to a light frost or do they succumb? These, so we do have the spicata types that are meant to um, pair well with your mums, but yes, a hard frost will will tell the plant that it's done for the season, um, and that usually it's you're never in. It's more of a fall issue. So for spring, I would say wait until after your frost free date to get the best results for your spring summer enjoyment. But in the fall too, treat them more as uh, decorator items that pair well, and when you're done with your mums and your pansies and you've got, kind of got your fall cabbage and you've hit that point where the frost is is coming, uh, the plant generally is going to degrade after that point. It's not going to melt in the garden the way some other plants will, um, like maybe an impatience, um, but it's definitely not going to continue to flower after that point. 
since we're speaking of like the season for Solosha's, I do want to admit how guilty I am at wanting to start things like super early because it's exciting and things are starting to warm up. This is one of those plants that you want to you want to wait until um, you're not getting any more 30 degree nights and the soil temperature has warmed up because it will just actually just perform better. And you could maybe try to make like an eight week plug from starting too early versus just planting it at the right time. And it'll just go so much faster. So it actually will be a healthier, happier plant just by waiting. And it'll shorten your grow time as well by, by waiting for the right, for the warmth, which it, it, which it appreciates. And somebody did just, I think this is going to have to be our last question, but I wanted to ask it because I have the question too. Um, I heard somebody talk about direct sow. I heard somebody talk about starting them indoors. I'm pretty sure the answer um, is it depends, but is it best to direct sow seeds versus starting inside? I'm going to say it depends on where you're located and how long your season is, but does anybody want to elaborate on that? I'll just do a quick one that others can elaborate on, but I think for cut flowers, the seed is so quick and so inexpensive. Cut flowers tend, growers tend to just direct sow, whereas uh, pack and pot and bedding tend to start a little earlier because they want that color immediately in the landscape, but that's the quick and dirty answer. <laughs> Yeah, and a plant is going to take a certain amount of time to to get to that flowering stage. And if the conditions, as you get closer and closer to warm conditions, but if you are on the back end of that, like if you're too far north and those light levels and heat starts to fade, the plant might not even get to that point where the uh, flower will, you'll have time to enjoy it. So uh, yeah, you'll you'll want to uh, adjust based on how what your light levels are and what your heat, your soil temperatures are. Excellent. Okay, I don't want to end but it's past the hour. Um, I, I had like 10 questions I didn't even get to, but I'm pretty sure all of these questions are answered in our Year of the Celosia article, which Gail posted a link to. But with that, I wanna thank all of our experts. Um, we had so many people, um, but thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists and our member companies. Thank you, Gail. Thank you to all of our attendees. And we really hope that you're gonna grow a lot of Celosia this year and enjoy them in your garden.